Welcome aboard all. This week we got Shane Mason on, Associate Editor of Model Railroad News. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Desi J from Model Railroad Techniques. Our YouTube channel produces video podcasts showcasing modelers from all around the world and also a few how-to videos in there for good mix. If you know of a model that might fit the bill, link below to my email. Please reach out and we'll try to get you on the show. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming content. Big shout out to a super fan of the channel, Richard Southcott. He's sponsored the channel on Patreon. So thank you very much, Richard. Without further ado, let's get started. Welcome aboard, Shane Mason, and thanks for taking time away this evening from your workbench to chat with us at Motoraro Techniques. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. So you can be found on uh, various social media, so predominantly on Facebook and YouTube. So your Facebook is Brakeman17 Custom Models, and also your YouTube channel is Brakeman17. So we'll obviously we'll go through exactly what that's all about and your little uh, your little cottage industry that's uh, growing exponentially by the looks of it. And also you've got an email, if you don't mind me giving that out. Um, yeah, st mason 17 at gmail.com and as i said i'll link that all below so thanks so much for having a chat with us here today mate um i know you're a very busy man as we've just spoken about so we'll uh we'll, we'll crack on and get to it sounds good so associate editor of model railroad news Obviously, I had your boss on here the other week, so his video went up, I think, yesterday. So um, we, be we better be on our best behaviour for him because he's uh, you know, a very strict man. So, of course, of um, course. How, how did it, that sort of come about? I'm sort of interested. Obviously, you're a you're just a young fella, the, the the young gun, as they call you. So, how did that sort of come about, and what do you do for the magazine? Um. So he, Tony found me. Wow, I guess it's been three or four years back now. Um, it wasn't too long after I got out of high school. Um, I was doing some videos for the YouTube page back when I had a little bit more time and he was going through looking for something and he's prolific for going online and looking for stuff. And as if you guys have listened to the, uh, his interview with you, you know, that he's always looking up HO stuff or stuff for the magazine or any one of the other magazines or scanning slides. So, um, he was going through YouTube videos one day and found one of mine where I was talking about my grandfather and I being, <laughs> Uh, be, or becoming members of one of the local clubs here in town. And um, he got a hold of me through email and asked if I would write an editorial about being a young guy in the hobby. Yeah. And uh, I, I just thought it was absolutely neat. But um, from doing the editorial, I, I didn't think anything of it. I thought I'd write the editorial and, and that would be it. And then a couple of weeks later, he came back and he asked, he said, the writing was really good. Would you like to do a review? And I figured, worst case scenario, I do the review. He says, oh, thanks for that. Never talks to me again if it sucks. <laughs> so I told him, I was like, that's worth a shot. So I did one. And uh, I think that's right when Intermountain did the SD40s and in scale. They had just come out. Yeah. So um, did that review. It ran. Didn't hear anything for a little bit and then until he came back to me and said, hey, that was really good. Why don't you do another one? And then another one, another one. And Slowly as time went on, him and I got closer. Uh, I started doing more photography, um, kind of working with getting the material shot when they come in. That way he could send them out to whoever's doing a review. So I just kind of slowly became closer friends with him. I, I, I have to say he is absolutely one of the best friends that I've got, both in and outside of this hobby. But um, slowly just kind of integrated me into the magazine work and then uh, – Decided at one point, I don't remember what month it is off the top of my head, but it was, uh, I believe it was early last year. Yeah. Um, picked me up, put me on the masthead as assistant editor, and off we went. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah, as I said, I had a really lovely chat with him. Uh, it was probably nearly a month ago now, but obviously the video went up yesterday. And that man's mm -hmm. knowledge for history, probably, you know, not just within the United States, but obviously a lot of those foundation companies like Tyco, hence the Psycho for Tyco type. Um, yeah. thumbnail that I put up um, is just phenomenal how that's just fed into everywhere in the world effectively um, and it's 
besides him, I, I don't know of anyone that's sort of going down and sort of methodically going through all those companies and giving a blow-by-blow -blow description of how they've come about and where they are now, if they are still about. Some of them obviously not, but um, yeah, it's um, it's a great. Yeah, um, I need to. I think I need to subscribe to your magazine because I've looked at some of your some of your photography and it's out of this world. Particularly your, I'm no photographer myself, but you've obviously got an eye for particularly the prototype type um, mm -hmm. photography. So we'll we'll, talk, we'll chat a little bit about that more in a sec. But um, so as assistant editor, what what does that entail? Um, so the the title really isn't anything special. Um, it, it really, I just try to make myself as valuable to him as possible. Whether it's uh, keeping up with new product that comes out, anytime I get emails on stuff, I try to forward them on to him. Especially because he's got a really good hold on the larger scales, the HO, the O. Yep. Um, and a lot of the modern stuff is also where uh, my knowledge steps in because a lot of what I've seen, you know, I've only been around for 23 years since 97. So a lot of everything that I've seen is from 97 up. Yeah. Um, so I fill in a lot of the reviews that are more of the modern stuff um, as well as, like I said, just kicking them new products, doing uh, reviews where needed, getting materials together for new announcements as well as photography, both for covers and inside the magazine. Yeah, nice, nice. So you're predominantly uh, an in-scale modeler, is that correct? Yes. Yep. yep. My uh, my primary scale is in-scale, but I got bits and pieces of a uh, little bit of everything. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you're au fait of the, uh, the Toy Story phenomena with Pixar and the like, so I sort of made a little bit of mention whether he was like the, the prospector, whether he, because obviously he's got so many sort of <laughs> – different models, whether he actually takes them out of the box. Are you a bit like that or some, some need to come out to, cause you bought them, you're going to run them or you, some of me just want to keep sort of pristine or, or buy two of them. Like you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, him and I are actually, it's really funny to listen to us talk about this kind of stuff because um, the two of us are very, very opposite of each other. Um, he buys stuff from the collector's standpoint and I try not to buy anything I won't run. Yeah. So it, 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 it's the way I try to keep myself from buying a bunch of stuff that I don't need. Yeah. But everything that I get is either going to be run, going to be weathered, or uh, it'll be in a nice display case, which I got some shadow boxes working now. But yeah. um, it, it absolutely breaks his heart every time we get something new. And I always tell him, oh, you know, this look great weathered. You can just see him cringe a little bit. <laughs> And just wonder why he picks me up for the magazine just for a brief moment. Yeah, but it's that but, yin and yang, uh, no, though, isn't a lot it? Of the so. stuff... What's that? It's the yin and yang of it, then, isn't it? So the, the yeah, polar opposites yeah, we are that... very much polar opposites in the yeah. in terms of uh, collecting and running. Yeah, yeah, I'm a bit the same. I don't see the point of having something that sits in a box, but I appreciate his point of view as well from purely from a collector's standpoint. So uh, it's mm -hmm. quite quite amusing. So, um. Prototypical photography, as I said, you um, just a moment ago, it seems to be a, a big passion of yours. So, is that something you've done from a young lad, or because have you obviously got any formal skills in photography? Because it appears that you've you at least done some sort of study with photography and composition. It, it looks like it. So, because there's some lovely photos that you've got. So, I appreciate that. Um, no formal training, nothing fancy. No. Um, I actually really didn't start shooting photos until. Oh, uh, probably after high school sometime. So in the last five years, um, sure. I, I mostly did video. That's why there was so much material on my YouTube channel. Yep. If you go back more than two or three years, I, I haven't put up much in the last two or three years just for the sake of not having enough time. But yeah, sure. um, I, I never really got into it until a buddy of mine here in town started. He He's a big on photography. Yep. And he told me, he's like, why don't you shoot some photos while you do videos as well? And I, I always like the video because it's kind of the same thing that Matt Herman at ESU does sound for. It's that preserving the sounds of things, especially uh, a lot of these yard units that we're losing, the old EMDs and whatnot. Sure. Um, a lot of them are either being rebuilt or scrapped. And, and having that sound, that original throatiness, it, yeah. you know, if you don't record it now, you'll never have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I used to do a lot of video. And then, yeah, about five years ago, switched over to photos. and. Uh, just absolutely loved it ever since. And it a lot of that has helped with both the model side and with the magazine because a lot of what I go out now and do is shoot 
oh, endless photos of prototype stuff. And then when the models of it run, we have reference photos to go right to when we go to run in the magazine. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So, um, so you're 23 years of age. So we'll, we'll go into, so you're not, uh, I'm nearly double your age next year. So thanks, thanks for making me feel <laughs> old. But for some, for some organizations, I'm actually not old enough. But anyway, that's, that's for another podcast or video <laughs> podcast. So we, we won't go down that rabbit hole. I've been talking to Marty, uh, Marty Jenkins too much of late. So, because <laughs> he's from my <laughs> neck. That'll happen to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, always, um, you've given us a little brief what you're sort of doing now, obviously, the, the magazine side of things. Um, so, the history of the hobby. So, I'm, I'm fascinated how people are where they are today, you know, what influences and how they got themselves into our great hobby. Um, you know, everybody has, most everybody in the hobby, I shouldn't say everybody, most everybody in the hobby had trained growing up. Um, my grandfather worked for Missouri Pacific from when he was 19 to when he retired with UP in the early 2000s there. So I always had a really strong influence from him. Uh, every time we'd go over to his house, it, there was always, you know, photos, the new calendar from UP, whatever it was laying around. And um, he was really my main draw to the whole thing. Um, when I was younger, uh, when he was still working for the Rare before he retired, he used to go down and pick up his paychecks in the yard office. And uh, my folks lived just around the corner from my grandparents, so they usually watched me during the day. So he would take me with him to go get his paycheck. So I remember being really young, um, sitting down outside of the yard office there at either Neff or Armordale, watching switch crews putt back and forth around. Um, so he was really the biggest reason I got into trains. Um I, I dabbled in scales. I really can't tell you I was on a, I was set on a scale until ooh, probably eight or nine years ago. Um, you know, everybody starts HO. I had some O. I had some G. Back down to O. Back down to HO. I had N scale briefly, um, but I was so young that I ended up breaking most of it. I think it was an old, it was just cheap Bachman starter set. Yeah. I, I didn't know any better being as young as I was. And then uh, my grandfather's brother is in a Model A club. Uh, with a guy who is one of the members of the Heartland Intrack here in Kansas City. And we got started with them. We went up one weekend to look at the layout. And then we ended up the next weekend and then the next weekend. So then we joined the club. And uh, at that time, I was still a freshman or sophomore in high school, so I couldn't drive myself. So he would have to come pick me up and uh, we'd go over to the club on Saturdays and run trains or whatever. And And that was really my first introduction to uh, modeling, not just having trains and running them in a circle, but that was my, really my first introduction to a lot of the things that make modeling, um, I, I guess, serious for a lack of better terms. When you start sure. looking at the weathering, and the, the prototypical, prototypical operations, that was really my first introduction was joining the Heartland Club. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So it's quite quite interesting you bring up about your grandpa. Um, my, I had a similar sort of upbringing. My grandpa didn't work in the railway, but they live literally across from the main road sort of near where we lived and was the main main line from where I live in a place called Adelaide, South Australia to Melbourne, which is in the eastern states of my country here. So we quite often used to go and we had, he had German shepherds, we'd go and sit over on the little grassy hill and just watch trains all day go up and down. So <laughs> a little bit similar to your upbringing. So I, I fully appreciate, you know, that's that's a fantastic little, uh, little backstory to that. So, um, your current layout. So tell us a little bit about the current undertaking, what you're building there. Um, it, it started not too long after we moved into our apartment. Uh, it's a little four by eight, four foot six by eight. Uh, U shaped. It's roughly based on the Kansas city area. Um, a little bit of the West bottoms area. There's another area just kind of North West of uh, downtown called Fairfax. Uh, it's just kind of a light industrial switching area. It used to be one of the old Missouri Pacific yards going back north. Um, when I was still living with my folks, I, I I think I had a four or six foot, one foot wide with a little bit of track. Nothing nothing ever uh, big enough to run much of anything. So once we moved in, I decided I, I really wanted to have a layout. I wanted to have somewhere I could run trains. So um started drawing up stuff, and I, I looked at some of the stuff, like Walker Embry's got the uh, – his little four by eight out in the middle of the room. And, and I sat down and drew up a couple of things and finally landed on a one foot wide that I, my biggest thing is I wanted to be able to switch, uh, especially with the proto throttles. It just adds so much to that. So 
Um, got some bench work up, got track work up, hand laid most of my switches coming out of the yard. Uh, got all the track down, wired it all together, and can't tell you I've made much progress since then. <laughs> kind of, everybody seems to kind of hit this block of once you get trains running, nothing else matters. You just want to run trains. Yeah, no, I but, fully appreciate that, and that's I think that's important. I think just to get trains running because it sort of keeps the interest going elsewhere. I think so. But, you know, sort of just a little switching layout. So what, what's the plan? Is there got a name yet for the layout or is it um, got that far? I don't really have a, a name. Uh, so far, I've just, the only thing I've really come up with is it's Union Pacific and it's based off the Fairfax area. Sure. So uh, it's really become, I guess, more or less the Union Pacific Fairfax switching district. But beyond yeah. that, nothing else fancy. Yeah, okay. So obviously with the switching. I haven't really tacked anything down only because we're, we're at the – I think this variation of the layout I have drawn up is like 1.3.11. I've made so many changes between buildings and track arrangement. and yeah. So nothing's really set in stone until this thing actually gets finished. So it's all still pretty flexible. Yeah, okay. So obviously being a switching layout, um, an interest of yours is the operational side of things, sort of, you know, prototypical operations is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. So, yep, do you, uh, so how, how do you... Okay, what, what's what's your passion there, I suppose? There's different ways of doing it, I suppose. I'm sort of beginning to learn. There's obviously depending, depending on what state you're in, uh, what prototype you're going with is depending on how you're going to run your railway. So how are you looking at um, running yours or are running yours? So <laughs> with mine, um, it's, it's pretty simplified one crew, all within yard limits. So there's no dispatching, no signaling. It's pretty much come in, pick up your switch list and – get right to work, switch it all the way through. And once you're done, you're done. Yeah, no. um, I'd like to think of it more as kind of a more elaborate time saver. At some point I'd yeah, like okay. to get it where I'm timing myself yeah. to see how quickly I can switch all my industries at once. But sure. Sure. Yeah. That's, um, I don't know who I was talking to recently. That's, um, they, they built a time saver exactly like, um, John Allen did, I suppose, back in the day. John Allen? Yeah, John Allen. Um, yeah. Where he used to put it out in his crew lounge and get people to practice on that whilst they uh, whilst he, they ran the, the gory and defeated the, the monster that he built. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. so, um, DCC obviously is a, a passion of yours. Absolutely. DCC sound. Yep. Yep. It's so always been a big draw for What? Obviously, that's the biggest in advancement in quite a number of years within our hobby, um, mm -hmm. electronic side of things anyway. So what, what sort of draw, drew you to the sort of the prototypical sounds? You're obviously, you've, you've touched on that you go and record prototypical sounds out in the field, so to speak, and then you put them to your decoders that way, I'm assuming. So what what sort of, what draws you to that, that side of the hobby, that little niche within our niche? Um, I, I really can't tell you where the initial bite was. Um, or what it is that really got me the first time. Um, I remember it was not too long after Bachman brought out the DD40X and in scale with sound the first time from soundtracks. Uh, one of our members had it, uh, brought it up to the club, ran it. And I, I absolutely fell in love with having that sound. Uh, just to be able to mirror the prototype that much more. Um, and, and that's really what got me into it was that one unit, hearing the, the sound. And even at the time, that still would have been oh, shoot, eight, seven or eight years back. Sure. That, to me, was still amazing that you could get sound in N-Scale, yeah. let alone fast forward to now with, with a lot of the uh, ESU version 5 stuff with multiple sets of braking, multiple sound effects, so many prototypical bits and pieces that they've added between spitters and yeah. uh, throttle levers and then being able to add your own stuff, which is one of my favorites, uh, going out and recording radio audio, putting it together and then putting it into my engine so you really sound like you're sitting in the cab with the your yeah. master blaring at you from one side and your conductor from the other. So um, it, it just adds that much more. And I, I know there's a lot of people that don't particularly care for it only because, um, you know, you, you can't, it's really hard to mimic that real world feeling, especially with a lot of the bass, the lower tones you get from actually standing next to an engine. But sure. um, to me, it, it, it just brings you that much closer to the real thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I've yet to delve into the, the version 5 ESU. I'm hearing it's pretty damn good piece of kit. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Between the uh, the quality of the sound from the 4 to the 5, 
it, it, it's night and day, let alone all the little sounds, the, uh, the spitters and then your brake bail offs, your brake set. I mean, all the little bits and pieces that really make the, yeah. that decoder hum. And it, it's all the automatic stuff. It's stuff that you don't have to control. It's all the stuff you'd normally hear when the engine's running. Right. Um, the, the, those fives are so much fun to install and then just let sit on the desk. I did, uh, I took a Broadway E7 and painted it to the SPNS 750 and put ESU five into it. And I think the first week I had it, I didn't even run it. It just sat here on the desk next to me at idle just yeah. to hear all those little bits and pieces of sound. It just, it really brings the, the prototype that much closer to the room. Yeah. Wow. I think I'm going to have to get into the ES fives cause I've got, I've still got some version three and a half, some, some of my older stuff and they're at the fours, which is most of my stuff. But I think I'm going to take the plunge. I'm hearing some great things and, and ease of, probably programming as well with the the lock program is what i use i'm assuming that's mm -hmm. what, what you use as well so so primarily you just use esu or are you into soundtracks and other other decoders or is it very depending what you what what locomotive you're doing depending on what um decoder you're putting in yeah it, it very much depends on project to project uh for diesels I, i'm very biased i go right to esu i, th I think the recordings are spectacular um not to say that TCS and soundtracks aren't as good. Um, I just think the the recordings you get off ESU are just a higher quality. Sure. Uh, everything sounds a little more crisp, a little more clear. Yeah. Um, when it comes to steam, though, I'm soundtracks, hands down, all day long. Um, the only steam I've done with the ESU is I've actually got a customer here who's got the, uh, the new Kato 844 that I'm putting the ESU file into. And, and that's the other tough part is when you start getting – files of the actual engines it makes it really hard to want to go to a different brand sure. uh, like soundtracks just put out their file for the big boy esu's had the the southern pacific gs4 the 4449 they're doing some of the cumbries and toltec stuff as well as the 844 so when you can really have the true sounds from the actual engine yeah. it's hard to uh yeah. hard to make a different pick yeah sure sure so let's talk about uh brakeman 17 custom models so this is time for your the shameless plug. So tell <laughs> tell us about what you do and how you do it, type thing. So, so um, the whole Breakman Seventeen Seventeen started as just the YouTube channel, and then uh, it wasn't but a couple years ago. I wanted a way to be able to share more of my modeling without having to sit down and make a full video of it. So I started the YouTube or the Facebook page, and it's actually been a really great outreach tool. Uh, being able to share what I'm working on as well as uh, re really being able to mass share that is the biggest advantage of that. Being able to click that or copy that link and then just share it to every page you can think of that's out there. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of it is mostly sound install stuff, lighting install stuff. Um, I used to be a little quicker on my turnaround times before I became a mechanic uh it's really eaten quite a bit of my time in the last year and a half fixing other people's machines but yeah sure um no i used to be quicker a lot of it is the sound and lighting installs i do a little bit of weathering most of the weathering i do is for myself only because I'm, I'm not afraid to do it i just i don't get many inquiries about it yeah. um i don't do much custom painting though that's the one thing that i i kind of turn away right. okay that was my next question whether you actually did something like that so obviously we've a lot of the photo or some of the photos on your Facebook are some lovely weathering and we'll go through some specifics because I want to pick your brain a little bit to how you actually go about doing some of these because it's something that's just off the chart. So, um, so DCC installs. So any, any, any scale are you doing? Uh, so, for the most just part. The drum? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mostly what I get is in scale, uh, yeah. quite a bit of HO. Uh, I got a gentleman out in Arizona that does quite a bit of brass HO through me. Yeah. Uh, never done any O scale or G. Uh, I've been really looking forward to. That's the one thing I'm always jealous of doing my own installs and in scale is the amount of space everybody from HO up has. <laughs> jealous yeah. completely. Um, I, I really enjoy doing the HO. Um, I've got some O scale here. I don't know if I'll ever do installs on them though, but uh, it's one of the things that I've looked forward to. Uh, just again, never got any inquiries on it. That's very interesting because obviously I'm HO European Steam. That's sort of my passion. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's a lot of my local managers, they don't have a lot of room, so it's quite interesting you say that they obviously don't have any diesels, um, different different setup again, but I'm sure with someone, if, you, if you're if you doing installs and you're finding room in in, in, uh, in scale stock, I think you'd be more than fine room in something that I'm doing, so <laughs> might have to pick your brain about that sometime, because I need to start, I think, installing some, um, what are they called? Um, the capacitor, not the capacitor discharges. Oh, the keeper lives. The keeper lives, that's the one. Yep. Yep. So I need to, some of my, uh, obviously I've got some longer locomotives, it doesn't really matter so much, but some of my little shunters or switches, depending on what part of the mm-hmm. world you're in, need, I think they need a little bit of help. So, yep. so how does someone get in contact with you for a DCC install? So how, how does that sort of start coming about? Um, the best way to get a hold of me is either the email or through the Facebook page. I get a lot of people that hit, that hit the messenger on the Facebook page. Um, the messenger is probably the best way. It's the way I get back the quickest. Um, right now, my response time is a little slow. Again, with work being, sure. you know, the the busiest portion of my life. You know, you got to pay the bills to have fun. So you do, you do. And uh, that's the 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 tough part about the hobby is when I started, I was doing a lot of this in a lot of my spare time, but uh, so much of that has been eaten up in the last couple of years. So um, I used to do this to pay for my hobby, and uh, I still do for the most part. I, I don't buy quite as much anymore, so it, it definitely hasn't hurt as bad. But um, my response time's gotten a little bit slower, and my turnaround time's gotten a little slower, only because you know I can only do so much, and it's only whenever I get free time, and yeah. it's only when I get free time. Yeah, sure, sure. So how long is, okay, so just a simple, okay, so we've got a, a an install that 21 pig decoder or something similar. Um, it's already got the harness already, so it's DCC ready. That's a very, obviously, a much simpler job and unless they want to go some elaborate lighting, I would think. So that's right. obviously what would take the time. So what, what sort of, how long has it taken you? Because obviously someone like a an amateur like myself at, takes me a long time just getting the loco body off let alone <laughs> I, I can work out how to plug the thing in but other than that so how long does it sort of take you to to get into the, something like that or uh from start to finish for me it's usually a couple hours even on plug and play yeah. um a, a lot of the installs i do i try to fine tune them and i get them as close to ready to go that way when you get it it's ready to go out of the box sure um i know there's some guys that just throw the decoder in and they leave the programming to you um, to, to me that never seemed quite right because uh, you're paying me to do the install to, to make the engine right and ready and get all the lighting and everything done so I, I go through and I do everything the lighting setup the speed or uh, all the speed curve stuff if you're doing multiple units I get them all matched together that way when you get them it's ready to go out of the box so even on a, a plug and play I still I'm still probably two or three hours depending on how much uh, adjusting I do in the file Sure, sure. And obviously someone can then say, I would like to have A, B, and C within that decoder, the way you set it up, if, even if it's sort of away from a more prototypical type way that you probably would set yours up by the sounds of it, but you sort of, if the customer wants it, they sort of get it top, top scenarios at the how, how, you, how you operate. Yeah, uh, it's the way I've always been. That's why originally I started part of the YouTube channel was for when I got installs done, I could put the video up and send it to the person. That way they can verify the engine is exactly the way they want it before we ship it. There, yeah. We don't have to mess with sending it back and forth and worrying about, oh, is it right, is it wrong? I know that when it leaves here, it is ready to go the moment it comes out of the box there. So yeah. um, I, I, I'll make recommendations, but however the customer wants it set up, uh, that's how we'll set it up. You know, If you want all your functions on everything from – 13 to 24, we'll put them 13 to 24. I'm not afraid of it. It's just not the way I'd do it. <laughs> the customer always knows best, so they say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So without obviously naming names, who would, no, not who, but what would be the, the most unusual install you've done with sort of the way they want functions and they want it to run a locomotive, I suppose, without putting you on the spot uh, too much? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think through. I've done quite a few of them. I know there's a lot of guys that do much crazier and, and more projects than I do. That I, I'd say the the goofiest install I've ever done was on, uh, oh, I can't think of the company that makes it. I want to say Aztec, but it doesn't sound right. But there's a company before Atlas bought the tooling that makes an in-scale vacuum that you run uh, behind your engine. 
It's got a little sander pad and a vacuum built in. And I had a guy who wanted it set up on a DCC decoder to where he could turn the vacuum on and off with the speed controls from the decoder. So uh, the the working in space on that was a little tough, only because there's just not much room on the insides of those. Yeah, sure. Uh, and then trying to keep it from getting a lot of material back on top of the decoder, trying to seal it off as much as I could. Yeah. Uh, besides that, a lot of my stuff is probably the craziest. Uh, <laughs> I've done some brass with really good lighting, but I've got some in scale that's got headlights, ditch lights, ground lights. Um, I mean, I, I've done all kinds of stuff on my own on on my own collection. So yeah. probably the craziest stuff's on my own stuff. Yeah, sure. So what's been the longest install from start to oh, start shit. to finish? The longest install, which I didn't time because I know I was most frustrated with it, <laughs> but the longest one would definitely be the brass HO F fifty nine PHI and tail car I did. Um, it's actually on my YouTube channel. It wasn't too long ago. Yeah. Um, it was an Amtrak California 59 in a tail car. The customer wanted sounds on both ends to where he could run it, either tail car or, or leading wow. with the engine. And uh, the tail car was the worst of it because the tail car was originally set up for no kind of power pickup. All the all those brass engines on the non-functioning lights have those jewels put in but they're yeah. solid behind. So having to drill all the holes, yep. uh, power pickups on the truck, and then get them all fitted into the car to where it wasn't showing through the windows. Um, there was a lot of hours on that tail car, but it really came out good. Yeah, nice. nice. Yeah. So just on pickups, just quickly for my own sake, because obviously I, I've i done a lot of installs for passenger cars because I found this nice little unit online. It's basically like a frick, flicker-free lighting unit, which is like a capacitor, effectively glorified capacitor right. with some transistors and light. So how, how do you do your pickups? Because obviously I did bastardize mine up with sort of some sprung brass strips type things. So how, how do you do yours? Um, on my HO ones, ESU actually makes a set of solder pads. It's kind of like a printed circuit board, and it's got a couple of brass fingers that come off of it and then stick out at an angle. And they rub the inside of that wheel face. Yeah. Um, on the end scale, it's not the most beautiful method, but I take a piece of wire and I wrap it around one axle, just a little bit loose to where it touches, but it's not creating drag. Uh, okay. Yeah. And then run it up over the top of the truck to the other axle. And then uh, I do the opposite on the other side in terms of the way the wheels are facing when they're isolated. Yeah. And then from that piece of wire, I run a lead wire that comes up into the car. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Yeah, no, I know that because um, I think DCC Concepts. I don't know if you're au fait with some of their stuff out of the UK. They they make ones like that for HO with a little that might look like little springs with tails on them, effectively. So, mm -hmm. no, that's great. So, now you said you didn't get into a lot of weathering, which has surprised me considering how good you're at it. So, do you, so you don't do any weathering at all for anyone but yourself no or... i i offer it completely i just i i never really get inquiries for it which is yeah, okay that's it surprises surprising. me too but so what we'll do i'll just show you we'll show people that some of the what's on offering can you see that all right shane that that um hot. so it does surprise me that you're not getting the whole works and jerks um because obviously people have got different skills but it seems to be you have a skill in the weathering as well um there's just case in point with this this hopper so have you had anyone that sort of that you have done the weathering for i think i i've done some steam engines uh i'm trying to think of what they were i want to say they were bno steam engines and and they were years and years and years back yeah. um i think i weathered those before i delivered or had them sent back to the customer but besides that, just never had anything big. Uh, this hopper was actually done for a good friend of mine who was in the hospital earlier this year from, uh, uh, of course, all this COVID stuff. So we nice. we did some cars and whatnot, weathered them up and auctioned them off to, to try and help them a little bit. And that was one of the cars from there. But, yeah, a lot of the weathering that I do is, uh, I mean, mo most of it, probably 95% of it is all my own gear. Yeah, yeah. Is your friend okay now or is he coming out the other yes, side. Yes, much better. Oh, lovely. Much better. It's, yeah, I don't, I don't like sort of dwelling too much on the whole COVID thing, but, you know, it's just a nasty, nasty... Yeah, we'll leave it there. <laughs> I Absolutely. think everyone I knows someone... Sorry? 
I said, absolutely. I don't blame you at all. Yeah. So there is a lot of thing, good things that have come out of it in regards to our hobby, not so much from people's mm-hmm. health point of view, but we'll, um, we'll leave it at that. So, um, so just talk us through. So when, when you've got, when you start looking at the weathering, you go to your plethora of, what would you call it? Prototypical type photographs and try to emulate that, or you've got something in mind and you do it sort of from uh, muscle memory or from photographic memory to sort of get you where know, we are I, with this. Yeah. Um, I, I've tried both. I really have. And uh, I know if anybody follows the Bob Fallowfield uh, up there in Canada, all of his weathering is done off the top of his head. I don't know how he does it. I, I can't. Um, I have to have, if I don't have reference photos of the actual, uh, the actual car, I'm looking for something that's close. I'm looking for something similar or something I can reproduce. Yeah. Um, I, I always tell everybody reference photos are your absolute best friend. Even if it's not the same car, if you've got even a, a rust patch that you like a lot, um, I'll take a picture of it, uh, save it, put it into a folder. And then if I ever need that sometime, whether it's on a, Oh, a building, a freight car, whatever it comes down to. Uh, just being able to see the way those colors layer and everything. Uh, yeah. I, I'm a firm believer in prototype photos. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So are you, um, so talk us through the process of how you would weather something like this. So we're talking about sort of the mediums you use. Are you predominantly all chalks? Are you washers? Bit of um, um, sort of air gun top um, or spray, spray brush, I should say, airbrush. Am I going? <laughs> get it out there uh, eventually. Just kind of <laughs> <laughs> it's all right make it there at some point um yeah. the biggest thing the biggest approach for me is trying to determine the effect that i want in the end um i don't do a whole lot of airbrush um unless i'm painting an entire car one color um or if i'm like tinting windows something like that effect but most of my weathering is uh, done by hand and brush. A uh, little bit of it's done with powders, not much though. Uh, a lot of my powders work is mostly soot and then blending some of my rust in, but sure. a lot of it is just acrylic paints. Uh, acrylic paints, a lot of washes, a lot of the, like Tamiya has a panel line accent color stuff. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it's just custom hand mixed. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's lovely. Lovely. So. So just talk us through, I think this is the photo I was looking at before, sort of the, the layering on this rust is just, obviously it's a very close up photo um, and it looks ultra realistic, let alone from, you know, 12 inches away. So talk right. us through, obviously rust is one of those things, everyone seems to have got an opinion, I do mine a certain way on galvanized iron or iron roofs when I do structures, but I've yet to venture into to my rolling stock. So how do you do your rust and your, your rust stains? Um, a lot of it is start from the back and come to the front. You know, that, that's the whole key to layering. Um, and I'm a firm believer in the halo effect. Sure. Um, start wide and then work your way up into what you're wanting your final product to look like. So right. for this car specifically, a lot of it started down with a wash. Um, I took kind of a, I want to say it was burnt umber, some white and black to make kind of a grimy gray. Yeah. Uh, apply that to the whole car. And I believe that was with a cosmetic sponge. Um, okay, sponge, yep. slather it on with a brush and then cosmetic sponge to get that texture to it yep. and then come back with a stiff brush and stipple it with alcohol yep. and that's what gives you kind of that uh, the way that the flaky effect yeah. grime follows yeah. the uh, panels on the car yeah and and that's going to be your base layer from there it's just starting with your really light rust everything that's going to be wide around your rust mark yeah uh, and then working your way in on the darker tones yeah lovely so very much same as buildings then. So the more layers, the better type thing. And sort of obviously the less is more as you build your layers out to, to get yep. what, what you're after. Yeah, that's yep. so very similar. And making sure you can get a real nice blend between the layers. That's the other part too, is if, yeah. if you've got a hard line between all your layers, you'll have a layer stand out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you then seal that with something or you just leave it as is? Um, uh, I seal all mine only because with the powders, you go to, uh, put your hands back onto it. You're going to put a fingerprint yeah. right back into that weathering. Yeah. Um, everything I seal with either, I think Tamiya, the spray can stuff is what I've been using lately. The clear flat. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, I also use the Vallejo matte varnish. Been a big fan of that through the airbrush as well sure. on uh, more of my engines. But yeah, everything I do gets sealed in. So this uh, UP, uh, this is one of yours as well. Yep. Yeah. So just this talk was us through, uh, you know, is this obviously yeah talk us through this weathering because this is just lovely. Um, this was a GMD one we got from Rapido to review from the magazine. It started out life as an undeck model. Um, I mean, bare bones, undecorated DC. Uh, so we took it, and I started out with a drawing of a GMD one, the line drawing, and just started playing with different paint schemes. Sure. Um, trying out the way the because the MP15 scheme is a little different from some of the other paint schemes. So spent some time drawing it up. Finally got something I liked. Uh, took it outside, airbrushed the uh, paint to it, and then sealed it in. And then started with most of the same way I do all the rest of my cars. Uh, started with that panel wash. Um, sometimes depending on how thin or what material you use, I'll do another set of clear coat between the panel wash and rust. Sure. Uh, only because I, I I don't like my alcohol at the, when I do my rust, I don't like that alcohol to eat away at the panel lines because you start getting really clean spots on your, uh, yeah. your doors. So sure. I might do another set of clear coat and then uh, rust right down the same, start on your light and work your way back. So young, young Tony, oh, sorry, your boss, he um, cringes when he <laughs> sees something like this, does he? Cause one of it's out of the packet. And I, I think there's a, there's a bit of him that understands and appreciates the modeling aspect, yeah. but uh, you, you can definitely tell on, especially <laughs> on some of the newer stuff. You know, on the yeah. undeck, it's different. There, there's yeah. no paint. There's nothing for it to be originally, but yeah. uh, I think everybody kind of has the same tripping point of heritage units. Yeah. Uh, I've got a lot of the UP ones, and, and those are the few units in my book collection that I've never weathered. Right. Um, I've done some of the detail painting, some of the MU caps and the handrails, but... I can never bring myself to weather him. And, and uh, he, he just kind of has that stop on everything out of the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. So. So I'll have him back on at some stage. I think yeah, it was a very, very amusing conversation, that's for sure. So um, so where do you sit with the weathering side of things? Because obviously I've initially came into this world from some of the craftsman kit modelers, the US craftsman kit modelers that are – like your George Selios's and all that, that ultra, ultra weathered to the nth degree. Obviously, we're talking mm -hmm. buildings compared to rolling stock and locomotives here. Um, are you someone, obviously, this locomotive, I would say mid, sort of medium type weathering to sort of the heavier side, or you sort of look at it and go, okay, well, I've got a prototype photo of that one. I wanted to emulate exactly how that looks. So I suppose what I'm asking, where, where do you sit for your weathering, wet weathering, I should say? You are, you like the lighter stuff or you like the heavy or sort of a whole continuum, I suppose, is probably the, the other right. phrase. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's weird when everybody starts from weathering. I, I think everybody kind of starts in the headspace of, as much rust as you can, as much dirt as you can, as run down as possible. And I think a lot of guys start in that space and then work their way back. I know that's definitely how it was for me. Um, I started out weathering everything, I mean, to deadline looks. It's going to scrap tomorrow. Nobody cares. Slap, you know, as much rust on as you want. Um, that, to me, would be a, probably about a medium job. That's middle of the life. There's not a lot of work on the side of the bodies. Yeah. Um, there's a bit of fading to it, a lot of rust along the roof and the top uh a lot of the top angle lines on the body the lower's got quite a bit of uh, rust to the trucks the pilot where it would hit a lot of material over the course of a uh, lifetime yeah but i i definitely try to i try to find that happy medium because there's some cars that you really don't need much more than a black wash and they're done and then there's some cars uh, especially like scrap gondolas um one of the companies that transfer or one of the companies that fills gondolas for my future layout they beat those gondolas left and right with all kinds of equipment, with scrap. So yeah. um, being able to f uh, flex your muscles a little bit and slather on the rest is always nice. But yeah. I definitely try and shoot a, a middle of the road. I want it to look sure. just the way it does in the real world. Yeah, nice, nice. So, yeah, just flicking through some of the other photos here of that, that, that locomotive. It's just spectacular. Obviously. One of my few custom paints that's come out real good. I got a little bit of cracking in the clear coat, uh, yeah. that top layer, but yeah. it ended up looking really good with the weathering underneath it. I'm sure that's what you're after, though. You're after that slight cracking, though, aren't you? 
That's why we're going to tell. Sometimes <laughs> um, I do have the Vallejo crack, uh, crackle, crackle medium. Yeah, it's yeah. sometimes that's what I go for, but I don't know how I did it, but I got the actual clear coat to crack when it went on. And I was, uh, I was mortified when I first saw it. I, I was mad. I, yeah. I was thinking I was going to have to strip the whole thing down. And once it all finally set, it looked really good across the top of the engine. And yeah, no, I wrote it off as a lucky mistake and promised I'd never do it again. <laughs> Probably would never be able to emulate that again. Oh, no way. So, yeah, it's lovely. So, obviously, we'll back to DCC just quickly. So, what is it that... So, it's quite interesting, you know, people going with the cottage businesses within our hobby, I think. Um, seems to be DCC One is one thing that a lot of people are scared of to want of one of a better phrase so what's your sort of experience for the the installs that you're doing i suppose is it more to do with the individuals just don't have the time or don't have the know-how or a little bit of both or uh you know it comes up to a really good mix actually there's no uh there's no one predominant side on that um I, i've done installs for doctors that just don't have time sure um i've done installs for you know, truck drivers that are never home, they can't do it. I've got, I've done installs for guys that are fluent in DCC. They just didn't like the project or I've got, you know, there's, there's guys that don't understand DCC much more than, you know, they know how to set it on and call it up on the throttle and go. So um, I, I don't think there's any one thing that really sticks out. I, I think there's everybody that I get usually has a pretty good mix. Yeah. Okay. Is there any sort of installs that you wouldn't touch in regards Oof. to DCC? Uh, Z scale. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Can you even do Z scale? I'm sure there's someone out there that has, but you're right. It's just I ridiculous. I think there's a guy out there doing them, and he, he's crazier than I am, that's for sure. It's like one to 300 or something ridiculous, isn't it? One to two. No, it's not. One like, to 200, I believe. One to 220, yeah. That's just something to that effect. That's just um, crazy. You know, I, I don't like getting close to anything I have to mill a lot of. Yeah, okay. Uh, so a lot of that comes with the later. Uh, you, you know, the 80s, 90s, 70s, 80s, 90s engines where they were just starting to get DCC. Yeah. Uh, a lot of those full body frames where they weren't DCC ready. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't like to touch them just because I don't have a, I don't have any way of milling. I've got a Dremel. Yeah. And uh, I know there's a lot of other guys that actually have milling stands that can do much better than I do. And as much as I hate to turn the work away, because I know there's a lot of guys that yeah. uh, most of the people that I get usually are off recommendation and they've seen something I've done. Sure. Um, I just don't want to be the one responsible for trying to Dremel half a frame out. And then I end up snapping a frame and I have to send you an engine back and 94 pieces going, <laughs> well, you know, well, we yeah. tried. Yeah, we tried. So, yeah. Um, Do you, often you know, get... it used to be brass. It really did until yeah. I started doing, I end up doing a handful of engines every year for a guy out in Arizona, um, all in HO brass. And I've really fallen in love with it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of room, a lot of openness and a lot of weight in those engines. That's yeah. Is that predominantly steam locomotives for that gentleman in brass or, uh, or, most in, or diesel? Actually. Okay. Yep. Yeah, they're just. It's just that old school medium they used to make them in. Obviously, they're, obviously, there's still people that are doing them, but you just can't get that detail with with plastic lot ready to run like we've got. Obviously, there's people out there that are doing it, but yeah, they're lovely. Mm -hmm. So my father had a lot of American brass steam locomotives back in the day when I was quite young and. He since got rid of them all when I was only very young, uh, probably four or five years of age. So, not happy about that. But anyway, <laughs> these things happen. So, so they definitely add a little bit. I've got a. I don't have much brass myself. I've got an Overland uh, SD40 tunnel motor in SP, and I've got a one of the Jordan spreaders in the daylight scheme. Right. And uh, it, 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 you're right. The the level of detail you can achieve with brass is it, it's unrivaled. Yeah, that's right. So. Is there any locomotive, <laughs> this is quite interesting because some of the guys that I sort of knock around with or are friendly with in my part of the part of the world, they, there's another gentleman that I had good friends with in probably the last 20 years, a fair bit older than me, he's in his 70s, that he does some DCC installs for people here and he just, I'll just hear him whinging and complaining sometimes about some of the rubbish that he gets through that people buy off, I won't mention company names here, but on online type <laughs> stores. Um, 
and then go, what the hell have you done? Why have you bought this? And it's just this absolute piece of rubbish that they want DCC. Do you, you, you get that topper? I'm assuming that's not inherent uh, to just to Australia, I'm assuming. so. No, it's, it's, it's pretty well everywhere. It's always tough when somebody brings you something from, especially that era of the 70s, 80s. Yeah. Uh, in InScale, you get a lot of that old Bachman stuff. I mean, even into the 90s, some of that slightly newer tooling, but still not DCC ready stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have a guy that brings me Concor, old InScale Concor. Right. And you know, I'll put DCC into it. But when that, that engine sounds like you got a blender running behind it, <laughs> you just wonder why you're putting the money in DCC decoders to it. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, there's definitely some of them where I just look at the guys and I'm like, no, no, absolutely not. I'm assuming you, sometimes, get a, you have yeah. to understand sometimes there is a, you get to a certain point where it's just not worth putting DCC into yeah. only because you, you want something that runs good before because you know, it'll run better afterwards. Correct. But Correct. if it doesn't run good before, it's not going to run, run a whole better. lot better. No, that's right. So now that's quite interesting because it's some of the stories he says, you know, people will just buy this stuff off this website. Um, I won't say it because I'll get myself sued probably. But um, <laughs> and this person obviously hasn't taken the 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 bot that the shell off, and they've looked under there, and someone's done a DCC install, and it just looks like a bird has nested in there. And he's just like sent me mm -hmm. some photos. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's so he ends up having to rewire the whole thing. It's just easier than trying to trace what this this individual who's put the decoder in before has done. So just clip it all out and then just start afresh. So. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Clean everything out and start all the way over. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, um, the evil overlord, I'll, I won't mention too much about him. I'll stay away from him, but <laughs> he will, um, he obviously calls you the young gun and he's a bit of a, an institution within our hobby, particularly obviously in the, the sort of the Northern hemisphere. So I will, um, at some stage, he will be on this show. So Lionel, if you're listening in. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like young Drew saying about uh, is it Jason Schron or Schron from uh, Rapido? See yeah. How time, see how many times we can say Jason Schron in uh, in an episode. So I've only said Evil Lord, Lord Ron Lionel Strang now twice. So that's okay. Mm. So um, <laughs> now Shane, I'd like to sort of thank you for taking the time this evening. Taken away, obviously. I we had a little bit of a false start regarding. I had to due to family issues, had to cancel and reschedule. So I do thank you very much for, for being so flexible like that and just listening to you about, you know, someone of, you know, of, you know, such a tender age. I, I shudder to think as you, as our, you know, as you get, you do more and more as we do, you know, your skills just exponentially explode. And I shudder to think what, uh, what, what's going to happen when you're my age, um, it's going to be fantastic. So another 23 years. So I look forward to it. So thank you so much for chatting to, uh, chatting with me at Moderaro Techniques today. I appreciate you having me. You know, it's been a privilege to be on with you here. Thank you kindly. Make sure you subscribe. Click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming videos. Support us on Patreon. Like us on Facebook and Instagram at Moderaro Techniques.